Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this particular series is based on a statement by Jesus, the least of these, ministering to those in need. And this is lesson number six in that series for August 10 of 2019, entitled Worship the Creator. Now, ministering to those in need, worship the Creator, how are those related? Well, let's see if we can figure that out. Let's begin, as usual, with a word of prayer. A kind and wonderful Father, we bow before you because we're seeking guidance and direction in our study of the Scriptures. Help us to know how we can come, can become more like you. Each day is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to try to look Uh, Last week we talked a little bit about the Old Testament prophets. We're going to try to dig a little deeper into some of their issues uh, this week. They were bold and brave in presenting their messages, even when addressing kings. They had a particular sense of anger and grief at the injustice being done to the people around them. You wonder if they had some friends who were being mistreated, or even maybe some relatives who were being mistreated. You wonder if there was something that really gave them an impetus to to really speak out. Who knows? Notice that often these messages from the Old Testament prophets about taking care of the poor and needy were given in the context of instructions about worship. Could it be that attending church and Sabbath school once a week is not God's first choice for how to worship Him? Oh dear, I didn't say that, did I? Could it be that living a life of generosity and selfless giving to others is really what God wants most of all? I don't know. If we read Matthew 25, 31 to 46, we know he talks about dividing the sheep from the goats. You might think so, huh? As we know, very soon after the children of Israel were called out of slavery in Egypt, they were given the Ten Commandments at the foot of Mount Sinai. Even before they had heard those commandments, they promised to do whatever God asked them to do. Exodus 19.8 And it was repeated to them again later in Exodus 24.3 and 7. Let me just read for the first one. Then all the people answered together, We will do everything that the Lord has said. And Moses reported this to the Lord. Wonderful promise, right? And they always did it, right? <laughs> I'm sorry. Try to imagine. I I think about this often. It just bowls me over. Moses is up in the fiery cloud at the top of the mountain, having what was probably the closest human-to-God interaction of all time, except for Jesus, of course, when he was here on this earth. And down at the bottom of that same mountain, I have climbed that mountain. You could climb it in a few hours. I mean, it's not a tall mountain. At the bottom of that same mountain... There are the people dancing drunk and naked around a golden fertility cult ceremony. I mean, how how could it be? How is that possible? Well, let me let me let me just put it to you in a little different way. Try to imagine what you would think or do if your pastor, leading an expedition with limited supplies through the desert disappeared into a fiery cloud on the top of a nearby mountain and was not seen for almost six weeks. What would you do? We sometimes hear on the news stories about people get lost in various places and there's all kinds of people out there searching for them in helicopters and airplanes and, you know, dogs, sniffing dogs and all that kind of stuff. Here's their leader. He disappears. And they can look up they can look up there and see the fiery cloud. And I mean, would you be inclined to think, well, he must have burned up, right? <laughs> I mean, what would you think? Depends on where your faith was. Yeah. 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 Well, that's the cloud, remember, that shook the mountain and the thunder and the lightning came out of it and so forth. I don't know. It's pretty scary stuff going on there. Yeah, but if they trusted God yeah. to take care of Moses when he went up there, then if that you were have been sober, issue. you might have <laughs> thought properly. Yeah. 
Well, nevertheless, if you saw someone walking into a fire, what would you think? Well, but you didn't hear any screams. <laughs> yeah, that's true. So, well, here's a question that I've asked, another question I've asked a lot of times I'd like you to think about. We often think about the challenge of feeding about two million people in the desert. We have discussed the issue of the manna, manna and what it implied and how, you know, six days a week but not on Sabbath, all that kind of stuff. What about feeding all the animals? Who fed them? And what did they get fed? Where did, and when they're dancing drunk and naked around the golden calf, where did they get the alcohol? Yeah. Well, if the water was flung from the rock, it might have grown grass around the area. And the animals could have eaten that, I suppose. Yeah. Alcohol, are, are you gonna, sure. gonna, How long does it take to produce alcohol from... Of course, well, they didn't have... A, in a, fridge. A, bigger question, a bigger question is how long does it take to grow grass? You're trying to feed all the animals? Yeah. I don't know. But you see, they had to realize that an unseen hand was guiding them. Mm -hmm. Just look, it's just a matter of few weeks that they saw the firstborn of the entire nation yeah. dead at midnight. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They saw all the ten plagues and some of them fell on them. Mm -hmm. You see, how could they ever, okay, 430 years is no excuse mm -hmm. when they saw the hands of a mighty God doing this. The, the Dead Sea parts and the walk through there. How did Aaron, being the spokesperson for Moses, yeah. how did he cave yeah. to them? He must have been afraid of them. Where did they get all that olive oil they were supposed to use in the ceremonies? <laughs> in the temple? I mean, I mean, where do those things come from? Well, look at Exodus 32, 32. Moses comes down from the mountain. He hears stuff going on. God says, you need to go down. He said, uh, go down there. And Moses comes down, and partway down the mountain, he gets with Joshua, and he's going further down, and they hear this dancing and singing and carrying on. And Joshua says what? Maybe it's war. Mm -hmm. and, jo and Moses says, no, it doesn't sound like war to me. It sounds like celebrating. And he gets down there a little bit further, and... I don't know, it was just pure shock or whatever, but he drops mm. the tables of stone that God had written on with his own finger. I wonder if those tables of stone are still buried over there somewhere. Mm. Incredible. Um, I once saw a cartoon um, shows J Joshua and, and Moses coming down the mountain like that, and here's Moses with this shocked look on his face, and he's just dropped all the commandments, and they're shattered like that. Uh, and Joshua says to him, you break all Ten Commandments at once and all you can say is oops. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, try to think of this in real terms. Well, so at, when Moses goes back up to, to God and says, you know, there's, there's nothing I can say. These people were just totally disgusting. Look what they did. So, there's no way you can save any of us. Just blot my name out of the book, he books of heaven. But he loved them. Yeah. He was, he get angry with people you love. He was angry, but he loved them. He says, you blot out my name. But please forgive them. <laughs> yeah. What do you think yeah. about that? How, how, do, we, do we have any other people who prayed like that? Yeah, all our wives, they're all saints, you see. Just like that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, what did God say to him? It is those who have sinned against whose me against me whose names I will remove from my book. Now go lead the people to the place I told you about. Remember that my angel will guide you, but the time is coming when I will punish these people for their sins. Boy. Of course, we need to remember that the children of Israel had been surrounded by idolatrous practice for hundreds of years in Egypt. How do you think that impacted them? Well, there's a very interesting passage. I'm going to read it. Psalm 115. 
To you alone, O Lord, to you alone and not to us must glory be given because of your constant love and faithfulness. Why should the nations ask us, where is your God? Now, I, I want you to think about this in, in terms. So these nations around them had their gods are made out of wood, their gods are made out of maybe metal, or gods are made out of stone and so forth like this. And they came over to Israel to look around and to meet the new neighbors in the territory. And they said, where's your God? I mean, you're worshiping, but where's your God? Well, our God is in heaven. He does not what he does whatever he wishes. Their gods are made of silver and gold formed by human hands. They have mouths but cannot speak, eyes but cannot see, they have ears but cannot hear, and noses but cannot smell. They have hands but cannot feel, feet but cannot walk, they cannot make a sound. May all who made them and who trust in them become like the idols they have made. And the footnote says all who made them and who trust in them will become like the idols they have made. Wow. Well, there's Ellen White has some very strong words about that as well. Jackie? It is a law, both of the intellectual and the spiritual nature, that by beholding we become changed. The mind gradually adapts itself to the subjects upon which it is allowed to dwell. It becomes assimilated to that which it is accustomed to love and reverence. Man will never rise higher than his standard of purity or goodness or truth. If self is his loftiest ideal, he will never attain to anything more exalted. Rather, he will constantly sink lower and lower. The grace of God alone has power to exalt man. Left to himself, his course must inevitably be downward. Wow. Great Controversy 555. Those are some sobering words. So now, why would a nation or group of people choose to worship a god of war? That's what their neighbors were worshiping. The, the Assyrians, they loved the god of war. Or what about a god of fertility? Why would you worship that? You're inclined to participate in war or fertility cults. Yeah. Well, I mean, let, let's think about it for a moment. Suppose you're a subsistence farmer. And what you have to eat for that whole year depends on how your crops grow, whether your animals reproduce, whether they produce milk and meat or whatever like that. Um, would you be tempted to worship a god of fertility? Did they ever get any evidence that the god of fertility actually did anything for them? Uh, how about god of, I think it's Asherah, that oh, yeah. they were offering sacrifice their own children? Yes. Really? Well, what did they get out of? And Israel did the same as well? Yeah. Solomon. Yeah. yeah, how many young people today are doing everything they can to imitate and idolize some movie star, rock star, music mm. legend? How is that impacting them? How many older folks are trying to... Uh, <clears throat> us? Could that be us? <laughs> trying to imitate the retirement practices of some successful business person? Hmm... What kind of reasonings for worshiping God are most important to you? Have you looked at what the Bible talks about? Think about, just can you mention some right offhand? What are the reasons God tells us to worship Him? He made us. He made us. Of course, He was a creator to start out with. He redeemed us. He redeemed us. That's the next big, huge thing that He did for us. In the case of Israel, He brought them out of Egyptian slavery. He brought them through the Red Sea. Think of all the things he did for them. Uh, just look at a few other places. My song is about loyalty and justice, and I sing it to you, O Lord. So David is saying, we worship God because of what? He's loyal. He's just. He's fair. Isaiah says, but the Lord Almighty shows his greatness by doing what is right. Mm. And he reveals his holiness by judging his people. In other words, judging them right. In Isaiah 61, 11, As surely as seeds sprout and grow, the sovereign Lord will save his people and all the nations will praise him. That's a pretty good reason for worshiping God, isn't it? So in the, among these Old Testament prophets, God is described as someone who is fair to everyone, who does not show partiality and does not accept bribes. 
He treats orphans and widows fairly. He loves foreigners and gives them food and clothes. He brought the children of Israel out of Egypt, having helped them to multiply from that group of 70 that first entered Egypt. He is a God of loyalty and justice, the creator of heaven and earth and sea. He always keeps his promises. He is fair to the oppressed and gives food to the hungry. He gives sight to the blind and lifts up the fallen. He loves righteous people, protects strangers, helps widows and orphans. But if they insist, he allows the wicked to go their own way to their own ruin. So sad. But God is a God of love and love requires freedom. So if God did all those things that we can mention for the ancient people of Israel, how much more has he done for us? Living this side of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Jesus not only died to answer the most important questions in the great controversy, but also he died to save each one of us if we are willing to let him. But he's also given us a clear pattern to follow in living out our own lives. Most of our Christian friends, however, have that false sense of security. Once you're saved, you cannot be unsaved. Mm -hmm. but go ahead. In a sense, it's sort of true, because I don't think God would let me go easily. Well, that's true. I, you know, you see Manasseh, who was the worst ever, ever, ever. Yeah. with burning all the kids and doing all the... And at the end of his life, God humbles him mm -hmm. and he repents. And God still takes him back. Oh, absolutely. So... Yes. Do you think being yeah. hauled off to a foreign nation with a hook on your nose... Or, <laughs> <laughs> it did something for him. <laughs> change your ways. But how many kings did, though? Well, it just... it, it, it It's a bit humorous because he knew... God was mm -hmm. what kind of God he was mm -hmm. and that he was merciful and would accept him back mm -hmm. unfortunately even in relatively prosperous times when the children of Israel were trying to follow God's will for their lives their religious rituals did not lead them to help the poor and the oppressed Amos described the people of his day like this Dennis Amos 8 verses 4 through 6 Look, listen to this you that trample on the needy and try to destroy the poor of the country. You say to yourselves, we can hardly wait for the holy day, days to be over so that we can sell our corn. When will the Sabbath end so that we can start selling again? Then we can overcharge, use false measures, and tamper with the scales to cheat our customers. We can sell worthless wheat at a high price. We'll find a poor person who can't pay his debts not even the price of a pair of sandals, and we'll buy him as a slave. Wow. Mm. Mm. Well, God had some pretty strong things to say <coughs> to the people who had turned away from him despite his many blessings. Look at Isaiah. Last week we looked at the last part of this sermon, but look at the first part. Isaiah 1, starting with verse 10. Jerusalem, your rulers and your people are like those of Sodom and Gomorrah. Listen to what the Lord is saying to you. Pay attention to what our God is teaching you. He says, Do you think I want all these sacrifices you keep offering to me? I have had more than enough of the sheep you burn as sacrifices and of the fat of your fine animals. I am tired of the blood of bulls and sheep and goats. Who asked you to bring me all this when you come to worship me? Who asked you to t do all this trampling, trampling about in my temple? It's useless to bring your offerings. I'm disgusted with the smell of the incense you burn. I cannot stand your new moon festivals, your Sabbaths, and your religious gatherings. They are all uh, corrupted by, their, by your sins. I hate your new moon festivals and holy days. They are a burden that I'm tired of bearing. When you lift your hands in prayer, I will not look at you. No matter how much you pray, I will not listen, for your hands are covered with blood. Whoa. How does that sound? Mm. God does not spare words in describing the terrible conditions of his people in those days. Which would Amos or Micah describe as better a better form of worship? Attending church and Sabbath school or distributing food to the needy at a feeding center? Can't we do both? <laughs> There's a good compromise. Sure, why not? Yeah. 
Try to imagine a time when people <coughs> thought that by offering their children as sacrifices on a pagan altar, they might be able to appease an angry God. You remember that verse? Let me just read that one. No, the Lord has told us what is good. What do we, I'm sorry. Look at verse 7. Micah 6, verse 7. Will the Lord be pleased if I bring him thousands of sheep or endless streams of olive oil? Shall I offer him my firstborn child to pay for my sins? No, the Lord has told us what is good. What he requires of us is this, to do what is just, to show constant love and to, lo to live in humble fellowship with our God. Well, let's ask a question now. How many of us have spent a significant amount of our lives serving the poor? If you're in health care, you do a lot of that. You might. Would, send it, would sending money to take care of poor people in other parts of the world be considered by God as equal to serving the poor personally in our own community? Uh, that's a big question. Because I've been on both sides. And we need to know where we're sending the money and how it's being used, not by stories, but yeah. by personally being there. Mm. Yep. <coughs> Well, Isaiah 58, and I'm going to take a moment, I think we have time to read most of this. The Lord says, shout as loud as you can. Tell my people Israel about their sins. Does that mean we stand down on the street corner and say, you, you sinner? Some Aaron. people do it though. Yeah? Some people do it. They worship me every day, claiming that they are eager to know my ways and obey my laws. They say they want me to give them just laws and that they take pleasure in worshiping me. The people ask, why should we fast if the Lord never notices? Why should we go without food if he pays no attention? The Lord says to them, the truth is that at the same time as you fast, you pursue, pursue your own interests and oppress your workers. Your fasting makes you violent and you quarrel and fight. Do you think this kind of fasting will make me listen to your prayers? When you fast, you make yourselves suffer. You bow your heads low like a blade of grass and spread out sackcloth and ashes to lie on. Is that what you call fasting? Do you think I will be pleased with that? The kind of fasting I want is this. Remove the chains of oppression and the yoke of injustice and let the oppressed go free. Share your food with the hungry and open your homes to this homeless poor. Give clothes to those who have nothing to wear and do, do not refuse to help your own relatives. I, you mm. talked about health care. Mm. I work with a, in, a, in a poor clinic mm -hmm. and I have people who come to see me that can't afford a bus fare to go home. Then my favor will shine on you, God says, like the morning sun, and your wounds will be quickly healed. I will always be with you to save you. My presence will protect you on every side. When you pray, I will answer you. When you call to me, I will respond. If you put an end to oppression, to every gesture of contempt, and to every evil word, if you give food to the hungry and satisfy those who are in need, then the darkness around you will turn to the brightness of noon. And I will always guide you and satisfy you with good things. I will keep you strong and well. You will be like a garden that has plenty of water, like a spring of water that never runs dry. Your people will rebuild what has long been in ruins, building again on the old foundations. You will be known as the people who rebuild the walls, who restore the ruined houses. The Lord says, If you treat the Sabbath as a sacred and do not pursue your own interests on that day, if you value my holy day and honor it by not traveling, working, or talking idly on that day, then you will find the joy that comes from serving me. I will make you honored all over the world, and you will, be, you will enjoy the land I gave to your ancestor Jacob. I, the Lord, have spoken. Amen. Wow. It's very clear in this chapter from the Gospel Prophet that unless we do what is right, as well as claiming to believe what is right, we're not serving God as we should. How could we remove the chains of oppression and the yoke of injustice, letting the press go free in our day? Do we have keys to the prisons? Do we... Well, people are bound spiritually by guilt and okay. depression. And, and Dale, I think you have some words on that. Yes, sir. Uh, this is from the Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide, Wednesday, August 7th. As we have seen previously, this criticism is addressed to people who are 
actively religious. They seem to be earnestly seeking God, but apparently it is not working. So, God says that they should try changing how they worship, to try a different way of serving God. If he were to choose how they would worship, it would be to loose the chains of injustice and untie the cords of the yoke, to set the oppressed free and to break every yoke. That's in Isaiah 58, 6. They also would feed the hungry, give shelter to the homeless, and help those in need. Wow. Would it even be safe to do those things today? Mm-hmm. I mean, we know about stories about people who tried to help other people and then they they get killed, or in some cases women are raped. So what do we do? Wise as serpents and harmless as doves. So we, we need to ask God where he wants us to go. And if he wants us to go in some place, you know, there are missionaries who've gone overseas to places and tried to break new ground and were killed in the process. Or my my wife has some relatives who went overseas way back in the early, early, early days in China, in early 1900s. And the husbands, they had, you know, the only transportation they had was bicycles. And they went to the interior part of China and they went off to an area... Two, two of them. One, one was conducting some meetings in one place, and one was conducting meetings in another place, and they came home to find that the wives had been murdered. Mm-hmm. Well, God is, is not. Is there a better ending to that story, like one or two generations later? I mean, sometimes yeah, well, you uh, hear yeah. something horrible happens, but then well, later. The rest of the story is that that family relatives of that family, spent a combined total of about 150 years as missionaries in India. Wow. How's that? End of the Sphere is another story. You ever Mm -hmm. heard of that one? End of the Sphere, Elizabeth Elliot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, beautiful story. No, things do happen even today, you know, things are happening. Well, God is not suggesting that we abandon our Sabbath services and our fellowship. But he is suggesting that serving the poor and the needy are also acts of worship. Charles? Yes, sir. The true purpose of religion is to release men from their burdens of sin. Aha, so now that's one way in which we can release people from burdens, right? Sorry, go ahead. Sure, and to eliminate intolerance and oppression and to promote justice, liberty, and peace. Okay, Bible Commentary, Bible commentary. Volume 4, page 306. Well, looked superficially, one might come to the conclusion that if we, if we were that generous with the poor and needy, we would soon run out of funds for ourselves. Could we, would God allow us to just give away all our means? Think well, about I that. I don't know, he might. Think about the woman who gave her two mites. How much did she have left? Nothing. Nothing. Zero. Do you think God let her go home and starve? Well, God saw it happening. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I sometimes, people sometimes talk about, you know, well, I don't give money to the church anymore because look at what they're doing here and what they're doing there. And I say to them, have you read the story about the widow and the two mites? Mm-hmm. Can you imagine what the Sadducees did with her two mites? They probably just threw them over their shoulder and said, this is not worth even bothering with. See? But Jesus said that was a wonderful thing and she has given her all and so forth like this. The, the church may be doing some things it shouldn't be doing. That's a separate issue. We should, we should address those kinds of issues through other means. It's not an excuse for us to give, to stop giving money. And he loves a cheerful giver. Yeah. It brings God pleasure mm-hmm. when we give happily. So, If we were doing more serving the needy kind of worship, would we really have more delight-filled Sabbaths? Absolutely. Jim, yes. I think you have something about that. The 58th chapter of Isaiah contains present truth for the people of God. Here we see how medical missionary work and the gospel ministry are to be bound together as the message is given to the world. Upon those who keep the Sabbath of the Lord is laid the responsibility of doing a work of mercy 
and benevolence. On white manuscript. Yeah. To you, no? Try to imagine for a moment what it would have been like to go to the temple in Jerusalem on a feast day as Jesus was ministering there. There were thousands of people bringing animals for sacrifices as various kinds of religious services were taking place. And Jesus stood there and said to the church leaders, and I'm going to stop there for a second. There's actually someone who wrote a report about people going for Passover at Jerusalem about 10 years or so after Jesus was crucified. They estimated that there were 2 million people who came for Passover that year. Not only that, they actually said that the, the temple priests had to say, okay, there's no way we can handle all these people, so we're going to require that 10 people bring one animal for sacrifice. We just, there's not enough time and space to kill all those animals. There's 200,000 animals being sacrificed. Can you imagine? Well, here's something that Jesus said. Matthew 9, verse 13. Go and find out. This is right in the middle of that. Go and find out what is meant by the scripture that says, It is kindness that I want, not animal sacrifices. I have not come to call respectable people, but outcasts. And where did he get that idea? Hosea 8, 6, 6. I want your constant love, not your animal sacrifices. I would rather have my people know me than burn offerings to me. Given what we know about Hosea and his marrying a prostitute and all that kind of stuff, and Jesus is quoting from him? <coughs> Jesus told him to do so. Yeah. <laughs> he says, I would rather have my people know me than burn offerings to me. What does that mean? It's a well, relationship, did, not, not uh, just ceremony. Matthew seven twenty one to 23 has some pretty sharp words to say about that. Not everyone who calls me... I'm sorry, I think that's yours, Jackie. Yeah. Okay, sir. Not everyone who calls me Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only those who do what my Father in heaven wants them to do. When judgment day comes, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, in your name we spoke God's message. By your name we drove out many demons and performed many miracles. But then I will say to them, but I never knew you. Get away from me, you wicked people. How would, you, how would it make you feel to have God say to you, get away from me, you wicked people? I would know I then that I, I didn't fool him. Yeah. I never knew you. What does that knowing mean? Incorporate everything you can about him. That's eternal life, John seventeen three, and and John 6. Mm -hmm. Eat my flesh, drink my blood. Yeah. What would our worship services and our Christian lives be like if we truly followed the example of Jesus? Well, the people in Isaiah's day, as well as those in the days of Jesus, believed that strictly following their religious practices would guarantee them a place in the kingdom of heaven. Jesus had some very strong words to say to those people. Mark, yeah, Mark 12, uh, 38 to 40. As he taught them, he said, Watch out for the teachers of the law who like to walk around in their long robes and be greeted with respect in the marketplace who choose the reserved seats in the synagogues and the best places at feasts. They take advantage of wid <coughs> excuse me, widows and rob them of their homes and then make a show of saying long prayers. Their punishment will be all the worse. There's a very interesting uh, passage that's in the Talmud <coughs> that talks a little bit about seven different kinds of Pharisees and there's one group of Pharisees that were known as the bruised and bleeding Pharisees. Bruised and bleeding Pharisees? What, what is that? They believed that it was wrong for a man to look upon a woman that he was not married to. And so they wore veils. I mean completely veiled when they went out in certain places to walk around. And they would run into things. And that was a proof of how, 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 how holy they were because th the reason they were running into things is that they weren't seeing any women they weren't supposed to be looking at. Talk about piety. Why? <laughs> Can you imagine that? Mm -hmm. Well, well, 
remember Matthew 23? Again and again it says, well, let's look at just a cute couple of verses. Then Jesus spoke to the crowds and to the disciples, the teachers of the law and the Pharisees are the authorized interpreters of Moses' law. So you must obey and, and follow everything they tell you to do. But do not, however, imitate their actions because they don't practice what they preach. And so he goes on, you know, and says, they tell you to do this, how terrible for you teachers of the law and Pharisees. Verse 13, you hypocrites who lock the door of the, to the kingdom of heaven in people's faces and you yourselves don't go in nor do you all those who, who are trying to enter. How terrible for you teachers of the laws and Pharisees. And he went on and on and on, as you know. Well, Jesus was not condemning those religious leaders for all the good things they did in their acts of worship, which they did some good things, but rather for the needful things that they neglected. How can we fall, avoid falling into that same trap? Falling into that same trap? Do we have the truth? I mean, we're Adventists, right? We have the truth. Or does the truth have us? Mm-hmm. Is there a real difference? Yes. If you have the possibility of doing so, read Isaiah 58, which we just did, in one of the more modern paraphrases, such as the message of the Living Bible. Okay. Uh, I think that's Charles. Matthew 23. Yeah. I'm supposed to read here. I thought it was Dale. Yep. Was Dale? I'm sorry. It's all right, sir. In urging the value of practical godliness, the prophet was only repeating the counsel given Israel centuries before. From age to age, these counsels were repeated by the servants of Jehovah to those who were in danger of falling into habits of formalism and of forgetting to show mercy. That's from Patriarchs and Prophets, page Prophets and Kings. Oh, excuse me, sir. Prophets and Kings, 326 and 7. And continuing, I have been instructed to refer our people to the 58th chapter of Isaiah. Read this chapter carefully and understand the kind of ministry that will bring life into the churches. The work of the gospel is to be carried by means of our liberality as well as by our labors. When you meet suffering souls who need help, give it to them. When you find those who are hungry, feed them. In doing this, you will be working in lines of Christ's ministry. The Master's holy work was a benevolent work. Let our people everywhere be encouraged to have a part in it. That's from Welfare Ministry, page 29. Very good. Well, does that mean we need to be handing money to everybody who stands on the corner and asks for it? Mm-hmm. But we could hand out clean socks and sandwiches. Okay. Have you ever had the opportunity of passing out food at a, at a, a feeding place, feeding center? Or you could take them... Uh, to into a restaurant or or uh, buy them some I, things from a from a grocery store. I have some friends. That's what they do. They go to they they, they go to a, a, a shop, a place, a Stater Brothers. It was a big supermarket place, and um, fairly often there's somebody out there asking for money, and the guy he was they will say to them, "Wait here just a minute," and they will go into the place. They will buy their own groceries at the same time. They'll buy a bag of groceries. And they take it out and say, here, if this is something that's good to eat, instead of I take give them the, a card to go in and get their own stuff, oh, okay. what they want. But the other thing is, <coughs> all the people, when you go, so many of them, they want to talk to you. They want to tell you their story. Mm-hmm. And nobody listens to them or has time. And they don't have time for each other either. They tend to mm-hmm. squabble amongst themselves. And uh, so I think the idea of uh, taking them to a restaurant, if there is something close by, is a very good idea because you'd have a chance to chat. Well, the the food card is a great idea, too. There's places that will redeem those things for money so they can use it to buy whatever drugs or whatever. So they're oh. I'm not it, supposed to tell them that. Oh, don't well, tell me that. I don't <laughs> want to learn. <laughs> can't learn any younger. For um, years, uh, <gasps> for years, this saint has been... Hours, but every week, with the homeless in downtown Orlando. Very Sometimes good. his life being in danger. So, well, even in a grocery store, you can buy 
alcohol and cigarettes and various things too. Yeah. So, yeah. but fortunately you, you now the the government programs, you're not allowed to buy that kind of stuff with them. With the but if you give them a card, that yeah. Well, the Jews in Jesus' day were so particular about many minute details in their law that while at the same time they ignored much larger issues such as justice, mercy, and honesty. Charles? Yes, sir. Matthew 23, 23 and 24. How terrible for you teachers of law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You give to God a tenth of even of the seasoning herbs such as mint, dill, and cumin. But you neglect to obey the really important teachings of the law, such as justice and mercy and honesty. These you should practice without neglecting the others. Blind guides, you stain a fly out of your drink, but swallow a camel. <laughs> Goodness, Bible. I, I try to imagine this in my mind. Here it's Passover time. There are literally thousands and thousands of people gathered around and many, many of them have come there specifically to hear Jesus. Okay, that's why they have come here, to be healed and to hear Jesus. And here are the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes standing around and he's saying things like this. Wow. So why is hypocrisy considered such a sin? What does hypocrisy mean? Say one thing and do another. Okay, that's pretty good. Actually, it's, it comes from a Greek word, hypo means under. And chrysia is, a, is a, a word that means a mask in ancient, in ancient Greek. So this was the word to describe an actor who was doing something different than what... I mean, obviously, actors present, represent something other than what they really are. The so one who would not look at a woman. Well, what I would say is that Christ knew exactly what he was doing. There were people who were doing, the, who, who came who knows how many miles to listen to this teacher, and he's really nailing it. So he has a dual purpose here. Yeah. He, he, he's already convinced many people that he's preaching what's right. Yes. But they have lived their lives trusting the saints and the Pharisees and the scribes and the Sadducees and they held those people up on a high pedestal. These are the people who tell us the truth. And finally at the end of his life Jesus says, you know I'm sorry but I have to tell you you can't trust these people. You can't trust them. He has to knock them off their pedestal before people say, hold on. Yeah, we like Jesus and we don't know why they don't accept Jesus but What's happening here? You get uh, scribes, Pharisees, and hypocrites. Yeah, we need to put the scribes and the Pharisees in there too, mm -hmm. because yeah. the uh, and then we got Jeremiah eight verse eight, where this he says, "Oh, the scribes say, oh, we've got the law, mm -hmm. yeah. but their lying pen has made it into a lie.' Yeah, that's yeah. pretty, pretty blunt. Yeah. yeah. Well, what's wrong with trying to look good? <laughs> Well, maybe you fool yourself and start thinking you are good. Yeah. But on the inside, you're wretched and you need to realize it so that you can come to God. And maybe people looking on will say, oh, maybe all you have to do is just look good. Yeah. You don't have to really be good. Yeah. Well, right. do you think all, the... All change that starts with, with an effort to... Well, with an impetus. In other words, a spirit of desiring to for something better. So, mm -hmm. yeah. When, because some people would say, well, if you try to do the good thing and you're really evil, then you're b telling a lie. Mm -hmm. You're being dishonest instead of being true to yourself, being mm -hmm. true to who you are or something. Uh, so all, all efforts to, to move forward, at least in, in terms of outward behavior, start with a, a sense of pretending Mm -hmm. In other words, if you get on a bicycle, you, you're you not saying, I can't do this, I can't do this, I can't do this. You say, I think I can. And <laughs> you, you try it, and maybe you fall over, and then you try it again. You know, and eventually things mm -hmm. work out. But if we condemn everybody that tries and fails, then pretty soon nobody will try yeah. anything other than what they 
they'll just fall follow back into all their old habits. So, but on the other hand, there are those who deliberately they're deliberately trying to deceive the people. So I think that's what Jesus was talking about. Ellen White says, and I should have the exact quotation right now, but I can't tell exactly where it's found. But she says, smile, parents, smile, teachers, though your hearts be sad. And you say, that's phony. That's hypocrisy, right? She goes on to say, but what is the truth? The truth is that we believe in God and we know what God has a final plan for all one of us, every one of us, and that plan is heaven. No matter what you're going through right now, there's no reason to look sad because you know what's ahead. Amen. Amen. Yes. Amen. Do you think the study of this lesson, reviewing the messages, the very pointed messages of these Old Testament prophets has expanded your idea of worship? Mm -hmm. What kind of activities could we as church members or as a church group undertake to reach out to the poor and needy in our communities? If we fail to do this, will Jesus still be able to come again in our day? I mean, if, the, if we're going to ultimately be judged, as it says in Matthew 25, by what we've done for the poor and needy, and we're not doing anything for the poor and needy, can he come again? He can come for those who are doing it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> One of the things that we can notice by reading the context of our lesson for this week is that when the children of Israel turned from a true worship of God to idol worship, they lost their concern for others. Do you think it is still true that God refuses to hear our prayers if we are basically engaged in self-centered worship? If we hear about some disaster that affects a person or a group of people in our community, would it be, would it be an act of worship to go on Sabbath morning to help? We lived in Washington State and uh, during certain times of the years it would snow and then the then it, that would turn to rain and the rivers would swell and the tide oh, would come flat. in. We don't have to talk about there. what's happening on the Arkansas. eastern side of the states right now. Arkansas, a river has gone 42 feet, Kristen. Yeah. 42 feet. Yeah. How yeah. many people? So helping people out. Uh, in those cases, going down and sandbagging to <laughs> build up the areas that were most uh, threatened. Uh, done that. Paddling your canoe out to rescue somebody on yeah. their roof. Exactly. Well, yeah. It is, well, if that's what needs to be done, that's what needs to be done. It is very clear from what we have studied that right thinking and right believing must be linked to doing right and behaving correctly. Do we know the truth? Are we practicing it? Compare Matthew twenty-five thirty-one to 46 with Isaiah 58. You know what those say. Could it really be true that the judgment each of us will face at the end of time will be based on how we have treated the poor and needy? Jim? Thus, Christ on the Mount of Olives pictured to his disciples a scene of the great judgment day, and he represented its decision as turning upon one point. When the nations are gathered before him, there will be two classes, and their eternal destiny will be determined by what they have done or have neglected to do for him in the person of the poor and the suffering. Wow. The Zara of Ages 637. Hmm. Well, how do you think you'll be judged if God's entire judgment is based on what you've done for the poor and needy? Hmm. That's a sobering thought, isn't it? Yes. Look at a couple of passages. Look at John 2, 12 through 16. After this, Jesus and his mother, brothers and disciples, went to Capernaum and stayed there a few days. It was almost time for the Passover festival, so Jesus went to Jerusalem. There in the temple, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and pigeons, also the money changers sitting at their tables. So he made a whip from cords and drove all the animals out of the temple. Both the sheep and the cattle, he overturned the tables of the money changers and scattered their coins. And he ordered those who sold the pigeons, take them out of here, stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that the scripture says, my devotion to your house, O God, burns in me like a fire. What part of the temple was being used as a marketplace? The, the outer court. And what was the purpose of the outer court? What was it supposed to be used for? 
Be more specific than that. The Gentiles were to be out. That is supposed to be the place where the Gentiles could come and see how the Jews were worshiping. And so what had happened is Jews said, well, we don't want Gentiles anyway. We don't want them here. We don't want them to have anything to do with it. This is, this is our temple. We want it to be just for us. So they turned it into a marketplace. The stock exchange. Yes, yeah, stock exchange. Mm-hmm. I, um, I, I, I have to smile every time I think about this experience because if you read carefully what Ellen White says in John 2, for the first time at his first major Passover after he started his ministry, he did this. And the scribes and Pharisees, after it was all over with, they sat down they said, how did we allow him to get away with that? He's just one guy, one man. Why did we run? We'll never let that happen to us again. <laughs> At the end of his ministry, he did it again. <laughs> I just, I had to chuckle when I think about that. They were, and she goes on to say they were in more of a hurry to get out of there than they were the first time. <laughs> Just a little sideline question. There was also, when you see the abomination of desolation, mm-hmm. that's about half a mile, I thought, around the city. Right? That, that was prophesied by Daniel. Right. Mm-hmm. But Christ repeated that. Mm-hmm. So that's half a mile around the city. When you see them surround, you know that it's time to leave. Yep. Yep. How do you think you would be judged if God's entire judgment based on what you've done for the poor and needy? Why would he look at that? Are we opening our church doors literally and figuratively to the disabled, the poor, and the oppressed? If not, what could we do to solve that problem? Here are some suggestions. Remember the oppressed in your prayers. Read scripture that focuses on biblical mercy and justice. There are more than two thousand verses from which to choose. Plan a worship service with a mercy and justice theme. Feature what your church is doing to meet the needs of the community. Even the offering time can be focused on mercy and help. Collect special offerings for a special social need that is spotlighted during some point in your service. Analyze your church's worship practices. Are they just? Are they meaningful to the poor? to the least, to all races, to young children and the elderly, to visitors from off the street. Are our cultures and languages included? Is there signing for the deaf? Ramps for wheelchairs? How does a sermon sound to the homeless, to the abused, the infirm and ailing, to children, or to someone with AIDS? Later, discuss with your church leaders ways to regularly incorporate Biblical mercy into your church's worship services. Wow. Could we do those things? Could we actually? You out there, how would those things work out in your church? And if you want that list for yourselves, uh, our handouts are available at our, on our website, theox.org. That's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G. So one church has done something which has become famous, and I love this posting a sign at the exit from their church parking lot which says Mm. service entrance. (laughs) (laughs) Would that be a correct description of your church? Jackie? It is not yet too late to redeem the neglects of the past. Let there be a revival of the first love, the first ardor. Search out the ones that you have driven away Bind up by confession the wounds that you have made. Come close to the great heart of pitying love and let the current of that divine compassion flow into your heart and from you to the hearts of others. Let the tenderness and the mercy that Jesus has revealed in his own precious life be an example to us of the manner in which we should treat our fellow beings, especially those who are our brethren in Christ. So I'm going to interrupt for just a second. Especially whom? Our brethren in Christ. The church members. Yes. Mm -hmm. How often do we neglect people even in our own churches? People who are really suffering, who need help. What are we doing for them? Okay, I'm sorry. Many have fainted and become discouraged in the great struggle of life. 
whom one word of kindly cheer and courage would have strengthened to overcome, never, never become heartless, cold, unsympathetic, and censorious. Never lose an opportunity to say a word of it, to encourage and inspire hope. We cannot tell how far-reaching may be our tender words of kindness, our Christ-like efforts to lighten some burden. The erring can be restored in no other way than in the spirit of meekness, gentleness, and tender love. Wow. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 5, page 612. <clears throat> wow. It's interesting to notice, and I guess I have... I have an advantage to having more opportunity. I had an interesting experience today. Um, I have to go, because I worked many years in Africa, I became, I was exposed to tuberculosis and became PPD positive. Never had the disease, but I, I was exposed to it. So every couple of years, I have to go and get a chest x-ray. So today, I went to get my chest x-ray. And it was my first time to go to this particular place where there was an x-ray place. But it's a place I send a lot of patients to all the time. And um, the lady who was taking my x-ray said, Oh, you're Dr. Hart. <laughs> she says, Your patients love you. She says, They love you so much because you listen to them and pay attention to their needs and so forth. You're never allowed to retire. <laughs> <laughs> that was the message I got from the x-ray lady today <laughs> but you mm. I mean you don't have to do any miracles you just some sometimes all you need is just listen to people mm. just listen to people in the days of Jeremiah despite the fact that the city had been besieged and attacked repeatedly people believed that if they just stayed near the Lord's temple God would not allow any evil to befall them. We just, you know, this is the Lord's temple. This is the Lord's temple. He wouldn't let anything happen to it, right? Do we ever exhibit an attitude like that? Surely the Lord would not let anything terrible happen to a faithful Seventh-day Adventist, right? <laughs> Do we ever talk like that? Do we ever talk like... Maybe we're special and God has a special place in his heart for us and well, nothing bad could happen to us. I am very special to God. Yes. Oh, sorry. We're running out of sorry. time. No, you are all very special to God. <laughs> Let's pray. Our kind and loving Father, we thank you so much for the privilege we have of being your children, of being part of your family, of being recognized as the children of the Heavenly King. May we act like that each day and may we reach out to others and encouraging them to join us is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.